Hey, thank you for joining the HLA Mismatch HSCT webinar. My name is Peter Deep, the Antibody Product Manager at One Lambda. I will be hosting our webcast today featuring Dr. Annette Jackson, the Immunogenetics Laboratory Director at Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Jackson will be presenting on HLA Mismatched HSCT, New Opportunities and New Barriers. During the presentation, please feel free to ask questions in the open field on the bottom right of your screen directed at the panelists. Dr. Jackson will answer the questions at the end of the presentation. It is now my pleasure to turn today's program over to Dr. Annette Jackson. Thank you, Peter, and thank you for all of you who have called in. Um, it's my pleasure to share this lecture today and to field questions and hopefully get some good discussion going on. Um, this is a lecture that I gave at a One Lambda workshop earlier this year, and Peter asked me to um, give it as a, as a webinar. And so it's, it's kind of set up um, in three sections I'm going to discuss for many HLA laboratory um, personnel. Um, the idea of why we have been moving toward um, HLA mismatched hemopoietic stem cell donors. Um, I'm going to revisit current um, literature on the role of HLA antibodies in bone marrow transplantation. And finally, I'm going to end with a few case studies, um, just showing our own experience here at Johns Hopkins, and discuss our desensitization protocol and our testing algorithm for HLA mismatched um, haploidentical transplantation. So with that, I will begin um, HLA mismatched hemopoietic stem cell transplantation, new opportunities and new barriers. Uh, this is a Thermo Fisher disclaimer. Um, the data contained in this lecture and my interpretation of the data is uh, solely my responsibility as a director at Johns Hopkins and not that of Thermo Fisher. So as many of you are aware, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation uh, provides curative potential for both malignant and non-malignant diseases. The basic premise is that malignant or the defective cells are eradicated via lethal doses of chemotherapy and radiation, something that, that I will refer to in my later case studies as uh, the conditioning regimen. Follow, following the eradication of these unwanted cells, um, donor, healthy donor hematopoietic stem cells are then infused to rescue the patient by reinstating the bone marrow and the immune system. Uh, one of the Big problems in hematopoietic stem cell transplantation is graft, uh, is graft versus host. The benefit is graft versus leukemia. Um, it is ho hopeful that the normal donor cells that reinstate the bone marrow will then be able to uh, prevent relapse of disease. So for many years, and definitely when I first got into the field, um, HLA identical siblings were the first choice as a bone marrow donor. Um, however, the likelihood of finding an HLA identical sibling is only 30%. The complications, as I mentioned, of following um, bone marrow transplantation is graft versus host disease. This can um, arise uh, in two types, acute graft versus host disease or chronic graft versus host disease. Acute uh, may present in the skin or the liver um, it may develop within 100 days of the transplant, and it can be severe and life-threatening. Chronic GVHD is, is a more diverse syndrome, and it develops after day 100. It was uh, identified early on, and this is from a 1981 New England Journal of Medicine publication. Um, the link between graft-versus-host disease and graft-versus-leukemia um, this slide shows that in patients um, that had no detectable graft versus host disease, their probability of a disease-free survival was much reduced below those patients that suffered acute graft versus host or chronic graft versus host disease. We know that the timing of transplantation is also important in patient survival, uh, early diagnosis, and transplantation um, following the first um, remission uh, portends better patient survival. The top graph shows um, the five-year 50% survival when the patients are identified and transplanted early in disease. 
um, a 32% patient survival um, when transplanted with intermediate disease, and advanced disease has a very low uh, patient survival rate. So the holy grail of hematopoietic stem cell transplantation is a rapid timeline to transplantation to maximize graft versus leukemia effects and minimize graft versus host disease, um, minimize engraftment failure, non-relapse mortality, and the relapse of disease. So for the 70% of patients that do not have an HLA identical sibling, um, our attention turned to HLA matched unrelated donors um, back in the 90s. However, a more recent review in 2011 showed that the true likelihood of finding an HLA A, B, C, and DRB1, or an 8 of an 8 allele match donor, was only 68% for white using the NMDP um, donor registry, and even much less for minorities. And this newer review by Spellman et al. in 2010 utilized data from earlier publications by Lee and Slumenberg and showed that, in, in truth, only 50% of the NMDP unrelated allele mismatched um, transplants that occurred via NMDP had 50% had an allele mismatch at a major HLA locus, and in fact, 88% were found to be mismatched for HLA DP. Cord blood transplants um, offered another donor option, um, and this really took off in the 90s, where HLA allele or antigen mismatch cord blood donor transplants occurred. This um, was very beneficial for minority groups, and this is um, data showing the role of cord blood transplantation um, in, by patients by race, showing uh, increased use of, of cord blood in these minority populations compared to whites in the lower right corner. HLA mismatch cord blood transplants um, allowed for a sh shorter search time. Um, there was less graft versus host disease observed. Um, this is likely due to the immunological naivete of cord blood cells. Initially, um, we were able to transplant across multiple HLA mismatches with, without severe graft versus host disease. Um, however, it, it, since then, a review of, of retrospective review of cord blood transplants has shown an increase in transplant-related mortality with uh, cord blood units mismatched for two, three, and four loci compared to matched units. There appears to be more graft versus leukemia with cord blood. This may be due to a higher number of NK cells contained in the infusate, the beneficial cure ligand mismatches at, um, due to HLA B or C mismatches, and the ability to perform reduced intensity conditioning for patients. The only downside of, of cord bloods may be that there is a delay in hematopoietic reconstitution, particularly in adults. And uh, since this was observed, there's been a greater emphasis in looking at the uh, stem cell number, the number of CD34 positive cells in a cord blood unit, and matching that better to patient weight. At Johns Hopkins, the vast majority of the adult transplants that we perform uh, involve HLA haploidentical donors. Uh, we were able to find haploidentical donors for nearly 90 95% of all patients that present and are evaluated here at Johns Hopkins. Uh, these, of course, there's a high likelihood of finding a, a haploidentical donor um, within your parents, siblings, and, and children. This is a schematic diagram of our haploidentical protocol. Uh, Preconditioning is performed with fludarabine and cyclophosphamide. There is a total body irradiation at day minus one, and the stem cells are infused day zero. There is a continued uh, taper of MMF and tracrolimus post-transplant. And what's unique about the protocol is the sci-fi um, cyclophosphamide infusions at day three and five post-transplant. 
Um, this is a non-myoblative uh, regimen, and it allows um, hematopoietic stem cells to be performed in both very young and very old patients. The post-transplant cyclophosphamide um, is thought to induce apoptosis of proliferating allo-reactive T cells in both the graft versus host direction and the host versus graft direction, so both in the rejection direction and the graft versus host direction. And therefore, um, as this immune response is mounting in both directions, sci-fi is given, the allo-reactive cells are killed, and it reduces the incidence of both graft rejection and graft versus host. And this is data from Luznik in 2008. Um, it was shown early, early on by Kasaman in 2010 that the HLA mismatches do not infer a greater incidence of severe graft-versus-host disease. And if you look at the bottom panel, it's the cumulative index of acute graft-versus-host disease in haploidentical transplants that occurred with 0 to 2 antigen mismatches and those that it occurred in the presence of 3 to 4 antigen mismatches. And you can see that the lines um, are superimposed upon one another. There have been studies that utilize a combined protocol using HLA haploidentical and cord blood donors. Um, the ad advantage of this is that you get rapid hemato hematologic recovery of T cell depleted haploidentical mobilized stem cells, followed by a slower engraftment of the cord blood unit that go on to replace the haploidentical stem cells um, in the marrow. Um, I might notice that in, in this study, the cord blood units were, were better matched than the haploidentical donor. The advantage of this protocol was that they showed that they could reduce um, the intensity of the conditioning regimen. They had rapid engraftment of the haploidentical donor and low graft versus host disease and durable remission. And this came from a blood 2011 article. So, the utilization of HLA mismatch donor has provided uh, a lot more opportunity for transplant for many of our patients. Um, this is a review from 2014 showing comparable outcomes with HLA mismatch donors. Um, in particular, uh, days to engraftment, uh, days to acute graft-versus-host disease, and reconstitution of CD4 cells. But with um, the use of HLA mismatch donors um, come new barriers. Um, most uh, bone marrow transplant clinicians are not used to um, thinking about HLA antibodies. Um, however, this becomes quite an issue um, when you're doing HLA mismatch transplantation, in particular haploidentical transplantation. Um, there have been multiple uh, studies in the literature showing uh, a role for HLA antibodies and specific donor-specific HLA antibodies and their role in graft failure or their association with graft failure. This has been shown in cord blood transplantation, haploidentical transplantation, and mismatched unrelated transplantation. Um, these publications have arisen in, in part due to the advancement in our ability to characterize donor-specific HLA antibodies both with our ability to identify donor-specific antibodies in broadly sensitized patients using single antigen beads, and our ability to um, detect the presence and absence of donor-specific antibody using um, luminex-based bead methods. This is a, a very interesting review by Yoshihara, published in 2012, and it, it reminds us that we have to to look at DSA in the context of a bone marrow transplant protocol. And in fact, the impact of DSA on engraftment may be different depending on the center's conditioning regimen and the donor source. Um, in this review, they point out that DSA may have a greater impact when using a single cord blood unit compared to a double cord blood unit. Um, and it may have a different impact when using a T cell depleted stem cell transplant versus an unmanipulated HLA haploidentical transplant using a marrow harvest. 
Um, this is a, a more current article from Stephen Spellman and the NMDP group in which they calculated uh, an odds ratio um, using conditional logistical uh, regression analysis looking at the association of DSA and grass failure. They found uh, that transplants that occurred in the presence of class 1 DSA had an 11 point odds ratio. Class 2 was similar with an odds ratio of 12. And patients transplanted in the presence of class 1 and or class 2 DSA, um, the odds ratio was 22. And so this and, and all the other publications that I mentioned looking at um, HLA antibody assessments in in the presence, in the context of bone marrow transplantation, suggests that accurate HLA antibody assessments are important when using an HLA mismatched donor. Um, and next, I'm going to talk about some of the um, complexities of HLA antibody analysis and uh, in, encourage uh, any clinicians on the call to to reach out to their HLA laboratories and to move forward in HLA mismatched um, hematopoietic stem cell transplant as a, as a partnership between the transplant clinicians and the HLA laboratory. Um, I'm going to show an example of the complexities of HLA antibody, and I'm, I'm going to focus on HLA BW4. HLA BW4 was a uh, serological uh, epitope that was identified very early on in, in HLA, and I cite a, a 1979 reference by Sir Walter Bodmer. It is a very immunogenic epitope that's present on approximately half of all HLA B alleles, and it's shown in this diagram as the yellow amino acids in the upper right-hand corner of this ribbon diagram of HLA um, B. HLA BW4 can be split into four subtypes, um, and this was published um, first in 1989 by Mueller. Um, this is looking at amino acid uh, residue 77 through 83, and they found that these different subtypes of BW4 could elicit different human responses. A beautiful paper that came out in 2011 by Cosmo Leopsis and, and their group um, showed that residues 80 through 83 really impact the electrostatic potential of the BW4 epitope, and that um, there's a significant difference in what an antibody sees, whether you have a BW4 that is an, of an IALR, shown in the first lower electrostatic potential diagram, compared to the TALR and the TLLR. This is the um, positive and negative charges of these different BW4 subtypes. And this is, if you will, what, what an antibody sees. Um, and so our laboratory went on in, a, in data that was presented at the 2012 National OSHI meeting to show that a patient who contains within their own phenotype, the pa if the patient is a B4402, they possess the TALR, the red motif. Um, however, that type of patient can be sensitized against the BW4 epitope present on a B51 containing the yellow IALR. And so that even though a patient is a BW4, they can make antibodies to other BW4 subtypes. And this becomes important because um, a BW4 um, antibody may be spotted by an HLA professional, but perhaps it may not be as obvious to, to a transplant clinician. And the, this has come up um, repeatedly in our bone marrow transplant patients because even patients um, who are transplanted with a mismatched unrelated donor with a single allele mismatch, these BW4 subtypes are contained on, on different alleles within the same antigen group. So I call your attention in the top yellow group, um, HLA B2702 contains a yellow IALR BW4 motif whereas a B2701 um, is in the red group containing a TALR, and 2705 contains a TLLR. So even when doing an allele mismatched unrelated donor, um, HLA antibodies can come to play in these types of very minor mismatches. 
Um, and now I'd like to share some data from Johns Hopkins. Um, this is a global loop view of the sensitive, HLA sensitization among our candidates for haploidentical hemophilic stem cell transplantation. The middle column shows their overall sensitization or the detection of HLA antibodies in these patients' sera. And the column on the right shows the incidence of donor-specific HLA antibody in these different patient groups. So across the board at all candidates, we see about a 22% HLA sensitization rate. 14% um, of our patients make donor-specific antibodies to their donors. Um, as it breaks out, of course, uh, female transplant recipients have a much higher incidence of HLA sensitization due to um, likely sensitization via pregnancy. Um, Harris females have even a higher yet incidence of HLA sensitization. 51% are sensitized to HLA, and a very large 42% do harbor HLA-specific antibodies to their uh, potential donors. This is our um, HLA testing protocol for our haploidentical candidates. At time of candidate evaluation for transplantation, we we do high-resolution HLA typing, and we do an immediate HLA antibody um, screening test to determine whether they're sensitized to HLA or not. Um, we report this out very early on in the process because it helps our clinician decide what protocols a particular candidate is um, eligible for and uh, whether they want to pursue a haploidentical uh, donor or whether they might uh, better have better success looking at an unrelated matched um, donor. For the potential donors, for all parents and children that arrive in our laboratory, we go directly to high resolution HLA typing in order to uh, facilitate more rapid donor identification. For siblings, half siblings, cousins, aunts, and uncles, we do first a first pass using intermediate HLA typing and then follow through with high-resolution HLA typing for those, that, uh, for those donors that, that appear to be a haploidentical match or full match. Uh, we perform monthly HLA antibody screening on candidates as they uh, are marching toward a transplant date. This allows us to do current and accurate um, DSA assessments as we're typing incoming donors. And that, again, helps the, the clinicians zero in on the most optimal um, donor from an immunological standpoint. We perform a final cell-based cross-match, um, and it, it falls between day minus 30 to day minus 14 with the selected donor. Um, the timing uh, really depends on the context and the, and the particular patient-donor combination. For very broadly sensitized uh, patients, we tend to do the final cross-match earlier on to determine um, the actual cross-match strength and look at the potential of desensitizing that candidate. And so depending on the complexity uh, of the patient-donor pair, we, we schedule the final cross-match um, a little bit earlier or a little bit later. We do recommend weekly HLA antibody screening for our highly sensitized patients or patients that have a historic DSA um, that have been detected. Um, Often we have HLA antibody data on patients when we were providing this uh, type of testing for them when they were receiving platelet transfusion. So we often have historic HLA antibody monitoring data on patients um, that were tested in platelet support type of situation, and, and we can use that type of historic HLA DSA um, as a, to identify patients that may be at risk for uh, a rise in DSA immediately post-transplant. Um, at Johns Hopkins, we do desensitize patients when they have um, significant donor-specific antibody. And I apologize for the truck noise. I, I should have I found a uh, soundproof room in which to provide this webinar, so please forgive any background noise. Um, this is a schematic of our desensitization protocol for our hematopoietic stem cell transplant candidates. It is really a modification of our desensitization protocol that was, has been developed and used in our incompatible kidney transplant um, program here at Johns Hopkins. Um, 
We do alternate day plasma phoresis along with low dose IVIG to replenish the immunoglobulin compartment. Um, plasma phoresis and IVIG treatment, the number is dependent on the DSA strength, and we determine DSA strength through a cell based cross match assay. Um, as you may or may not know, some of the, our bead assays that we use have a very high level of HLA antigen on the beads that does not translate to um, a physiological HLA antigen density that we see on a cell. And so we use a cell-based cross-match to assess cumulative DSA strength and then recommend the number of plasmapheresis and IVIG treatments um, dependent on the cross-match strength. Um, the, the big difference between our desensitization protocol for our kidney patients and those for our bone marrow patients is the discontinuation of desensitization treatment during the pre-transplant conditioning regimen. And this is so that the um, chemotherapy agents are not removed by the plasmapheresis. Um, so from day minus seven, plasmapheresis and IVIG um, sessions are stopped, and the patient is then given their cyclophosphamide and fludarabine conditioning regimen. Because the plasmapheresis um, treatment has stopped in our kidney transplant program, we often saw a rebound in DSA. Um, so there is a risk for DSA rebound during this conditioning um, hiatus when we stop the plasmapheresis treatment. So to guard against this, we add one additional plasmapheresis and IVIG treatment on day minus seven, uh, day minus one, excuse me, to guard against any DSA rebound. I have to say from our experience, we do not see that the rebound in DSA is, a, is as great in our bone marrow transplant patients as we had observed in our kidney transplant patients. However, we often tend to start at a much lower DSA threshold at time of desensitization. So we pick better donors to which the patient makes less DSA, and that is, may be a contributing factor to seeing less rebound in our hematopoietic stem cell transplant patients. And now to, um, I'll walk you through some case studies um, in which we desensitized uh, haploidentical mismatched donors to, to show you kind of how, what we see in a clinical setting. So patient one is a very broadly sensitized patient. Um, for any tr uh, bone marrow transplant clinicians on the call, I, uh, forgive me for the use of a CPRA uh, calculation. A CPRA is a calculated panel reactive antibody. It's a term used in solid organ transplantation, and, and what it does is it provides to the clinician um, information as to the breadth of HLA sensitization. It predicts the likelihood of finding a donor to which the patient um, makes an donor-specific antibody. So a, a patient that has a 93% CPRA, that means 93% of all donors that walk, in this, walk into our hospital, the patient will have donor-specific antibodies toward that, those donors. So this is a broadly sensitized patient with very not only broad HLA-specific antibodies, but very strong HLA-specific antibodies. Um, the CDC cross-match PRA is 93% um, antibodies that would yield a positive flow cytometric cross-match. Um, the CPRA goes up to 98%. We evaluated for this particular patient um, both parents, one child, two half-sibs, um, cousins, and five mismatched unrelated donors. Um, after all those donor evaluations, the best potential donor was found to be the patient's sibling. Um, the patient's sibling had a single donor-specific antibody directed at the HLA DR16 mismatch. The DSA was at a flow cytometric cross-match level. Um, we performed a cell-based flow cross-match, and it was um, weakly positive. And this is the patient's desensitization course. Um, for all three case studies, I'm going to present a graph uh, showing HLA antibody strength um, denoted using a mean fluorescence intensity on the y-axis and time relative to transplant on the x-axis. Um, 
in each case, the DSA is shown in a green line. In this case, the patient had DSA to the DR16 mismatch. The positive control values are shown in orange, and a third party or non-donor HLA antibody is shown in blue. And as you can see, the green line, the DSA was reduced significantly um, with three plasmapheresis and IVIG treatments. The desensitization was stopped during the conditioning regimen, and this patient did um, experience a slight rebound. You can see the green dot at day minus one does rebound up from 5,000 up to 7,000 MFI. The patient was treated with um, a day minus one plasmapheresis treatment. The transplant occurred at day zero, and the patient did receive one more plasmapheresis treatment at day plus one. And that patient did engraft by day 30. Um, patient number two was also broadly and strongly sensitized against HLA with a CPRA calculation of 85, um, with antibodies strong enough to yield a CDC crossmatch, and a PRA of 99, um, identifying HLA antibodies strong enough to yield a slow cytometric crossmatch. Um, her mother, uh, one sibling, an aunt, and cousins were evaluated as potential donors, and from that donor pool, um, an HLA haploidentical sibling was selected. Again, this sibling, there was a single DSA directed against the mismatch HLA-DQ6. Uh, at the day, at the time of assess, in which we assessed this potential donor, um, that, we performed a flow cytometric cross match on day one, uh, 180 days prior to the um, transplant date. The cross match was negative. However, when we received um, the final cross match serum sample on day minus 30, um, we, had, we observed that there was a significant increase in the DSA strength. It had gone from a low negative level up to a potentially CDC crossmatch positive level. We found out by reviewing the patient records that this patient had been admitted to the hospital with um, cellulitis. And um, as HLA people on the call know, um, Inflammation, uh, whether it be an active infection or a transfusion, um, all can result in a change in HLA antibody status with an increase in antibody strength and an increase in antibody breath. And in this case, um, we attribute to this strong increase in DSA as well as uh, an increase in the third-party antibody um, as a result, result of this cellulitis infection. Um, this just recaps what occurred on day 60 prior to the transplant. The patient was hospitalized for cellulitis. The lab was not notified and no serum sample was sent to the laboratory. And so at the day minus 30 final cross-match assessment, we identified a significant increase in HLA-specific antibodies to include antibodies to um, B7, DR15, DQ6, and DP4. Um, we performed an actual cell-based crossmatch at this time and found that it, it was a CDC crossmatch positive with B cells at a titer of 16. This titer was determined to be too high, and so an immediate unrelated donor search um, was initiated. Due to the patient's HLA typing, we were unable to identify a 10 of 10 um, matched unrelated donor. Um, a new mismatched unrelated donor search occurred, we identified five mismatched unrelated donors that had an allele mismatch for DRB1. Um, there were no DSA to any of these donors, and so a mismatched unrelated donor transplant was scheduled, was delayed and scheduled for six months later. Um, that patient did, did engraft. And my third case study involves um, a patient who had was broadly sensitized, but with weaker level HLA-specific antibodies. So the patient harbored no HLA antibodies that were strong enough to yield a CDC uh, cross-match positive, so the CPRA for CDC-level antibodies was zero. However, the patient did have very broad HLA sensitivity with a CPRA calculation of 89% at the flow cross-match level strength of HLA-specific antibodies. 
We analyzed two children, four siblings, and three unrelated donors for this patient. Her haploidentical child was um, chosen as the, as the donor of interest. The patient had antibody to three of the mismatched antigens, HLA-A1, B57, and DR7. At a cell-based cross-match assessment at day 180 days prior to transplant, she was found to yield a, a negative flow cytometric cross-match. However, um, at the time of final cross-match again, on day minus 30, there again had been an increase in the DSA to A1 and B57, as well as the DR7. Um, as you can see, we were doing um, monthly testing, and at day minus 150, there had been no change in the antibody status, but at day minus 30, at the time of final cross-match, there had been an increase in DSA. In talking with our nurse coordinators, we uh, found out that the patient had received five red blood cell transfusions at another hospital, um, and this likely is responsible for the, in, for the change in HLA sensitization status, um, which is another uh, potential risk as a patient. Many of our patients that are proceeding toward hematopoietic stem cell transplantation um, are on platelet support, and this shows the pre transfusion um, single antigen B MFI for A1, B57, and DR7, and the post-transfusion um, SAB MFI. And you can see that while the A1 DSA did not increase, antibody to B57 and DR7 had a substantial increase um, following the transfusion event. At time of the final cross-match, um, the DSA had increased to a positive flow level and an urgent search for an HLA matched related and unrelated donor um, occurred. Um, we did, were able to identify for this patient an HLA identical sibling um, that had not been typed because the sibling was much older than the candidate, um, well into her late 60s. Um, the decision was to go forward with the older donor and the transplant occurred two months later. And this transplant, of course, occurred without any HLA antibodies because they were identical out to through the DP loci. So one of the take-home message is um, that in, in addition to having good communication between our transplant colleagues and, and the HLA lab, we also um, have developed a good communication between our lab and our trans transfusion medicine support. Um, however, this sometimes is difficult if the patient is being treated for their disease and, and transfused at an outside center. In, in our HLA, in our center, we um, provide HLA class one typing to our platelet support docs and we identify what HLA antigens the patients are sensitized to and provide them as a void for platelet support products. So in summary, HLA mismatched hematopoietic stem cell transplantation offers expedited transplant options for nearly all um, transplant patients regardless of age and family size. Successful desensitization can be achieved using lessons learned from incompatible solid organ transplantation. And HLA antibody characterization and monitoring both prior to and following hematopoietic stem cell transplantation um, can be very useful in guiding uh, treatment of the patient. And good communication is needed between the laboratory and both oncology and trans transfusion support. Um, most importantly, what I tried to portray in the case study is the need for flexibility. Um, the laboratory needs to be ready to, to switch to different donors and be ready to perform cross-match assays and assess DSA um, very quickly. And sometimes uh, we get very involved in doing that unrelated donor searches um, in order, if there's been a sudden change in HLA sensitization status as we're marching forward with a um, haploidentical donor to which the patient originally does not make DSA. And so with that, I would like to acknowledge um, the Johns Hopkins Immunogenetics Lab. I work with a fantastic team here in the laboratory.
and um, my esteemed colleagues in the Sidney Kimmel Comprehensive Cancer Center. Thank you very much.